Hi, I'm Tim. Join me in this video is October 2nd, 2023, as I offer some thoughts and observation on remote ID and RC pilots that are not compliant with the FAA. Let's get to it. Hello, everyone. It is um, October 2nd, 2023, as I mentioned, and most people know that the remote ID ruling that was to come into effect on September 16th, 2023 has been delayed six months and will no longer be enforced until March 16th, 2024. So we have from now about five and a half months to get everything squared away with remote ID. There are three components of remote ID, the standard remote ID installed in drones in the factory, a remote ID module, which you can add to any plane that needs a remote ID capability, and finally, the FAA recognized identification areas, the FRIAs. The standard remote ID was going pretty well. That was had to be compliant December 22nd, 2022. Manufacturers were complying with that. The FRIA process started off kind of slow, but was picking up. We probably have, I would guess, about 1,200 of FRIAs approved now. There's about 2,500 uh, AMA clubs. The part that was absolutely missing was the remote ID modules. They just weren't available. Um, there are essentially two U.S. companies that make them, uh, Spectrum with their Sky ID system and um, the folks out at uh, Flight Test with their Easy ID, both around $100. I ordered my uh, Sky ID on August 25th. It's October 2nd. I still have not received it. So without those remote ID modules, <clears throat> many of the commercial drone operators that needed a remote ID capability added to their drones would have been grounded if the rule had taken into um, had taken effect on September 16th. So I think the six month delay was was anticipated. It was the right thing to do. There's a lot of moving parts with this whole remote ID situation, <clears throat> and to have five and a half months to catch up on everything, I, I think we'll be in very good shape by March 16th uh, with equipment availability and understanding the rules. Just a bunch of things. One other item on FRIAs, the FAA recognized identification areas. Right now, they have to be requested by a community-based organization. The AMA is one of four community-based organizations. <clears throat> the process is moving along, but there is a um, chart called the UAS Data Delivery System with the FAA that shows a wide range of information, uh, maps, airways, restricted areas, all sorts of stuff. On that data delivery system, FRIAs will be displayed. Uh, they're not displayed right now because there's no need to, <clears throat> because remote ID is not really in effect. But once <clears throat> things settle down and the FAA starts populating that data delivery system, you'll see every FRIA on uh, the map. So let's take just a quick look at that data delivery system. This is the FAA's UAS data delivery system. If you Google that, you'll come right to this chart. It's an interactive map. You can see there are layers of various things that you can put on the map, like the high altitude en route approaches under the West Coast. That was pretty interesting. When you deselect a layer, that will go away, and we'll do that with the en route approaches. And you can also zoom in on portions of the map to see specific areas. The green circles are controlled airspace uh, for those local airports. Eventually, FRIAs will be on this pull-down layer menu. We can go to it. Here's an example of clicking the VFR sectional chart. You, you used to have to purchase these charts, but this is the entire sectional chart that will really show you how the airspace is um, divided up <coughs> in the United States. Again, just all part of this data, data delivery system that will eventually have FRIAs. One thing that I'll harp on a lot in this video and future videos, <clears throat> remote ID is here to stay. Remote ID is not for traffic deconfliction, necessarily for safety. It's just the very first step for the FAA having an awareness of the thousands of unmanned aircraft that are flying in the national airspace system. You just have to understand who is flying in your airspace to ensure that you still maintain a safe airspace system. And <clears throat> even though Hobbyists may do some silly things with their drones flying in controlled airspace. The real drivers of remote ID are the commercial operators, the large-scale commercial operators. There was recently a commercial UAV expo in uh, Las Vegas. Uh, it was in September of this year. There were 232 exhibitors, uh, over 3,400 um, identified professionals attending, 60 countries, 48 states. The commercial drone industry is huge and getting bigger all the time. 
what the goal of the commercial operators are, fully integrated manned, unmanned operations. That's what they want. To get even close to that, something like remote ID starting to identify aircraft and operators of unmanned vehicles is a first step. Remote ID will evolve over time. It'll come up with different names. Hopefully it'll get a little bit better, safer for people um, worried about uh, knowing their takeoff location. But remote ID is, is here to stay. And it's um, and the FAA just, they're being directed by Congress to do this. That was in the 2018 Authorization Act. So as part of this five and a half month period before we have to really do remote ID, uh, the FAA is uh, increasing its outreach on social media. And recently they did a, they, well, actually about five days ago, they presented a one hour video on remote ID. Now the video was called Remote ID Drone Event. Doesn't mean too much. There's a link to this video in the description. But what happens on this um, one hour uh, FAA video, it's an interview, a question and answer period with three people. There's Kevin Morris, who for, I don't know his exact title, but he is <clears throat> the FAA drone guy. You're gonna see him a lot on media discussing remote ID drones and, and so forth. Then there are two drone operators, Greg Reverdian, um, he heads up Pilot Institute, and Keith from Alien Drones. Uh, both of their channels are very good, commercial drone operations, um, they're, they're very good to listen to. So these three gentlemen just had an, um, an hour just to discuss things about um, remote ID drones and, and how the regulation is going out. So um, some of the topics they talked about is remember, there are two things the FAA did for remote ID. It means of compliance, that are the technical things a manufacturer has to do to have a compliant remote ID system. Then once that is built, it has to be demonstrated to the FAA, and it has another item called a Declaration of Compliance, a DOC. The Declaration of Compliance is like your graduation certificate. It is the FAA saying that you've complied with the means of compliance, and this is a legal remote ID system. The reason it's important that you be aware of this is you, there is a possibility of people buying a drone that says remote ID equipped or something on the outside. If it doesn't have the, um, the declaration of capability of compliance from the FAA, it's not a compliant system. It's very easy to check that on the website. There's probably, last time I looked, about 190 DOCs on there for various manufacturers of drone models, but it's incumbent upon the modeler to check to make sure if their drone says it's remote ID compliant, and it is in fact remote ID compliant. The other thing that came up um, that was kind of interesting, um, is the FAA going to grandfather older drones? In other words, if a drone was made in the past year or so without remote ID, will that be grandfathered so it doesn't require remote ID after the remote ID ruling comes into effect? And I don't know where this rumor sprung up, but um, Keith, from, or Kevin rather, from the FAA says, no, that's not true. There are no drones being um, grandfathered. Remember the vision of the FAA is every drone, this is a civilian drone over 250 grams, every civilian drone over 250 grams flying in the US national airspace system needs remote ID. The only exceptions for these people are in a free of the FAA recognized identification area. Now keep in mind, these are civilians. It does not cover government or military personnel. They are exempt from the remote ID rulings but most of their flying will either be in restricted airspace or in a combat zone. There was a little bit of discussion on the remote ID range. <clears throat> Some of the ranges are pretty small, uh, short with the remote ID. Uh, the FAA didn't give a real clear answer on this. Basically, if the remote ID was built to the means of compliance requirements and has a declaration of compliance certificate, it's good to go. I think we're all going to be in a fairly uh, interesting learning curve as more of these remote ID systems are out there and we see how they actually perform. So that was um, the thing on the range of the remote ID. Uh, Kevin discussed the free approval process. There's a lot of people that were concerned that there were delays in the free approval process. He says there were, there are. <laughs> the initial free approvals were, took an extremely long time because the FAA really didn't know how to go about doing this. As more freeers were approved and the process got ironed out, the, the, the approvals went a lot quicker to include re-engagement of previous denials. There were some changes where they could be approved. So I would guess probably about half of the AMA's uh, submitted free um, uh, requests have been approved. 
and we should be in very good shape with a freeze by March 16th of 2024. The subject of a ramp check came up with drone operators. So for those of you that are not pilots, a ramp check is where an FAA inspector can come up to a pilot. It could be a commercial pilot getting ready for United Airlines flight. It could be you with your says at the local airfield. And the ramp check, the inspector comes up and they have the right to do this. It's in the regulations. They identify themselves and they say, I'm here to do a ramp check. So if you're a um, full-scale pilot, they want to see a picture ID, they want to see your license, they want to see your medical. There's a range of things they can ask for and ask questions about you and your aircraft and the flight that's going to be happening. So the question came up, can the FAA do a ramp check for drone pilots? And the answer is yes. Now, I don't see any reason to be concerned about this for now. It's not going to happen anytime soon. Um, Kevin did make the point that safety first, if you're flying the drone, somebody comes up and say, please wait until I land the drone before we can talk. But it'll probably be a similar thing. You could ask their ID. They're going to ask for your ID. Recreational pilot, you might have to show a trust certificate for Part 107, your, your, your FAA certificate for that. And then some other things, your registration number is a drone mark, things like that. So we'll, we'll see how that evolves in the future. And then the other thing that was um, interesting, I'll expand upon this a little bit later. In my opinion, the FAA is really very new to the subject of drones. Um, they are comfortable with full-scale aircraft, commercial certifications, but drones, how they're made, who the producers are, the um, commercial pilots, the recreational pilots, the fact that they don't operate, um, the drone folks don't operate off of uh, regular airports all that regularly. This is all very new information, and I think the um, FAA is trying to sort that out. Where I saw this really was when the discussion came for remote ID and drones. So for recreational pilots, if you fly recreationally over 250 grams, you need one remote ID module for your entire fleet. You could have 50 aircraft. You just swap the remote ID between the 50 aircraft if you fly outside of a FRIA. The Part 107 commercial, you could have a remote ID module or built-in capability for every single aircraft that you fly in the Part 107. So the question came up about swapping modules between aircraft. And again, the FAA is used to dealing with a producer, somebody that makes the drone that can point to like a Boeing or a Cessna for aircraft. And the fact that I can make a foam board airplane literally in an afternoon in my uh, workshop here, uh, flight of the afternoon, the fact that I am continually swapping out electronics, motors, and so forth between aircraft, it's very hard to pin down who a producer is of an aircraft for standard ID, remote ID modules, and so forth. So it's good to have these discussions now, and I think we'll see some more uh, movement, evolution as time goes on. So in conclusion, there were three big takeaways I took from this video. Again, it was a very <clears throat> interesting video to hear the, the thoughtful discussions between the FAA and two drone people that, that know what they're doing. The first thing, as I've discussed before, the FAA is very new to, to drones and RC model aircraft, producers, who makes them, swapping out components, basically having a trail of connectivity of all the parts that go into a drone or, or an RC airplane like they can for a Boeing aircraft. That just doesn't exist for the drones. So when you start adding remote ID modules, registration on an FAA database, and linking all those together for flying, it gets complicated. And I'm not sure the FAA quite has a handle on that yet. I will see changes coming for that that should be better for all concerned. The other thing is the FAA is really focused on these unmanned aircraft as drones. I just I hear the word drone everywhere. They're not talking about fixed wing model aircraft. Will there be a separation between fixed wing and rotary wing aircraft that we go out to club field, shoot touch and goes versus the drones someday? Uh, but I think the main concern is drones. And the reason is drones just go to a lot of places. They explore because they'd like to take pictures. They typically don't go to a field every weekend to shoot touch and go traffic patterns. But again, we'll see how that evolves over time. But the other thing that I find quite fascinating <clears throat> is the FAA, for the very first time in their existence, are facing a group of pilots that actually resist the fact that the FAA exists and that they have to follow regulations from the FAA. Now, this might seem fairly absurd at first, but 
The FAA up to now, they're regulating pilots. Pilots want to be pilots. They want to fly safely. They want their aircraft to be safe. So they follow the regulation. By and large, manned aircraft pilots fly the regulations. Commercial, for sure, they're going to lose their job. Recreational ones, just so they can enjoy the flying. However, for drone and some RC pilots, they said the FAA doesn't even have the authority to regulate RC models. I've had some very uh, clear comments on the YouTube channel that I'm not going to follow the regulation. The FAA cannot do that. I had one viewer explain to me that because the FAA was not discussed in the Constitution, they have no authority to write regulations. I don't think this is too much of a problem for the Part 107 drone operators. They are going to be flying their drones. They want to fly the drones into Part 107. They realize that if they don't follow regulations, their certificate could be taken away and they, they'll lose their ability to do what they, what they wish to do with the drone. But for the recreational drone pilots, they literally don't have a certificate to be taken away that are actively not following the regulation. It's going to be interesting to see how that situation evolves, both for the FAA's understanding that you have a non-compliant pilot group and the recreational pilots themselves on the remote ID. I, I, I don't know. I think for the drone recreational flyers, it's going to be kind of a self-correcting problem because all the drones are built in the factory with standard ID built in. So if you accept that a drone lasts three or four years by year four, all the old drones will be cycled out. Every drone purchased and flown will be remote ID compliant, except for the few that are built uh, by, the, by um, individuals. However, for people flying RC aircraft or their property out in the middle of nowhere without a remote ID module, that are not going to ever put in a remote ID module, it'll be interesting to see how that discussion evolves. So that's, that's all I have for now. So again, it's a good thing we have this five and a half, uh, six month delay on the remote ID implementation. It'll give everybody a chance to settle down and, and get to the, um, uh, understand the situation better. And we should have a much clearer idea of remote ID, the website workings, a whole bunch of things by March 16th of 2024. Thank you.